Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm very happy to introduce you to great, great scientists. They really brought an incredible contribution to our understanding of the reality, at least from the material point of view. I will begin with Dr. Luca Matone, who is part of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. It's a group of more than 1,000 scientists worldwide who have joined together in the search for gravitational waves. On February 11, 2016, the LIGO collaboration, in partnership with its European counterpart, Virgo, announced their success in making the first direct gravitational wave observation on September 14, 2015. This observation consisted of a gravitational wave signal produced by a cataclysmic event involving the merger of a pair of black holes more than a billion light years away. Dr. Mattone first began working on gravitational wave research as a student. He is native of Rome, Italy, and became his research also in Italy with the Virgo collaboration. He earned his master's degree in physics at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, and then continued his physics studies in France, also with the Virgo collaboration, earning his physics PhD at the Université de Paris. This eventually led him to the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, where he joined the LIGO Commission team. At one point, he even asked his wife to relocate to the high desert of Washington State so he would be closer to the detector. He wants to say that he's still happily married. <laughs> Dr. Martone currently holds a research position at Columbia University and focuses on public outreach. He has taught at Fordham University, teaches at Regis High School in New York City, and mentors students in their scientific research. So Luca, tell us, first of all, what are these gravitational waves? Introduce us into this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and share with you um, this story. Um, if we can play the slides. We should be able to see them there. OK, thank you. Um, no. So the way that I like to begin is, well, as Maria Teresa was mentioning, I'm part of the LIGO scientific collaboration which is responsible for the detection of gravitational waves that was observed and announced last year. Um, the title of these slides, Listening to the Universe, um, essentially uh, they note, represent the fact that we have now found another way of uh, making observations with, uh, of the universe, if you will. We are so accustomed to using our eyes to see and now this particular machine that I'll be speaking about actually is capable of looking at the universe in a different way, akin to like listening, for example. And the way they like to begin is by showing you this view, which should be very alien to us to live in New York City. This is the view of the night sky, taken from a remote part of the country. And you clearly can see a structure of stars. That's, of course, the Milky Way. Um, and when you look at images of this, of this kind, you're simply um, overwhelmed by the number of stars that are out there. You do see a structure of stars, the Milky Way. We know today that the Milky Way is actually the place where we live, our galaxy. So when we look up, when we look up at the sky, we actually look at the profile of our galaxy. The thing is, well, the many observations that we can make on, uh, on this particular view, one of them is the fact that you see there are a lot of, within, within the Milky Way, there are a lot of regions that seem to be dark. Those regions don't represent the absence of stars, but rather the presence of dust, interstellar dust, that actually prevents us from looking at uh, what's behind them. 
And every time you, every time you look at images of this kind, of the night sky, of other galaxies, of planets, you always have this message that in the end, uh, um, it seems that we live in a world that's very peaceful, that not much is going on. If there is something moving, it moves very slowly. And this is actually far from the truth, because we know that in the place where we live, in our universe, essentially, there are truly very bizarre objects, very strange things, pulsars, neutron stars, black holes. And it's not as peaceful as we think. It can be very violent. In fact, last year, after the announcement of gravitational waves, in a faraway place, and a long time ago, occurred a cataclysmic event, something we cannot even picture. Um, we don't know where this event took place. Um, we have a general idea, the direction of this cataclysmic event. But we do know, we do have information about how far away this event took place. And this event took place about 1.3 billion light years away from here. I have to remind the audience that one light year is the distance that light travels in one year. So that cataclysmic event that was observed by looking at gravitational waves essentially it was 1.3 billion light years away. That also implies that that particular cataclysmic event, which I'll be able to show you in just a moment, actually occurred 1.3 billion years ago. And the moment this particular event uh, occurred, okay, we didn't have much life here. Only single cell organisms were living here on Earth. Taking that information from gravitational waves and reconstructing what the event looked like, we can feed this information to a simulator, okay, that essentially simulates that particular cataclysmic event as if we're not far away from it. Mind you that this event is completely invisible. In other words, no light should have been emitted by this. In front of you, you should see the coalescing and the orbiting of two black holes. These two black holes were orbiting around each other, dancing, if you will, and they coalesced to form a third black hole. It is the moment of coalescence, it is the moment of coalescence in the end, that um, released a large amount of gravitational waves that we were able to observe just last year. The signal arrived in September 2015. So one thing I would like to do is I would like to play this, uh, I'd like to play this again one more time because you see the two black holes here are represented by these dark disks. Of course, no light can be emitted by black holes. And they're so massive that they are able to distort the image of the background stars. That's why you see the image of the background stars being a little bit warped like so. To produce essentially this, uh, a third black hole. Now, if you pay attention, we have indication of how massive these black holes were. So one of these black holes was uh, about 29 solar masses, 29 suns in one spot, 36 suns on the other spot they coalesced to form a third black hole. And the third black hole was about 62 solar masses. And if you do the math, it actually doesn't add up. Three solar masses, three suns vanished, disappeared. They completely got converted into energy, not light, but in this form of energy called gravitational waves. So, the detection that occurred last year was a big deal because not only were we able to see gravitational waves, but also we were able to infer what was the source of this emission of gravitational waves. And it made headline news everywhere, throughout the world, essentially. Front page of the New York Times, front page of the Washington Post, CNN, USA Today, and so on and so forth. But I tell you, one of the things that struck me the most was um, Taking the New York uh, subway, I think it must have been in, uh, in March, and then observing that I was standing in front of an ad, 
and the ad simply read, scientist found gravitation waves in outer space. <laughs> if it only were that easy to find a apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. <laughs> and I'm there standing in front of this. It just, it just struck with me how much this particular observation, this particular event resonated with our culture. <laughs> So black holes, uh, I'm sorry, so gravitational waves. What are these gravitational waves? Well, it turns out that gravitational waves are essentially uh, distortions, uh, ripples in the space-time metric that can only be produced by these cataclysmic events, such as the one of two orbiting black holes. And behind me, you can see now that there's a simulation, a numerical simulation, where you have two black holes and they're dancing around each other. Underneath it, is a representation of the fabric of space-time. That's one of the things that Albert Einstein, with his general theory of relativity, you know, gave us an understanding. We live in a four-dimensional space called space-time. The thing is that as the simulation is running, space-time is represented by this grid that you see here. And that grid is supposed to be flat, but it's not. The presence of these black holes actually is able to warp this fabric of space-time. Okay, and that warping, um, you are able, if you have these cataclysmic events, to actually generate ripples on the fabric of space-time, and it is these ripples that corresponds to gravitational waves. In fact, you should have been able to see it uh, in the simulation, which I'm going to run again because I would like to show you something. Let me see if I can do this. There you go. So you see the two black holes orbiting around each other. Underneath it is a plane. It should be flat, but it's not. You see two holes. The two holes essentially represent the deformation in metric of space-time. Okay. As the two black holes get closer and closer together, the warping of space-time gets just bigger and bigger to the point that we have to ask the simulation, the computers, to slow down. So at the end, we appreciate what kind of deformations are taking place. Now it's about to slow down. <laughs> deformations keep increasing. At one point, the simulation will freeze. Third black hole is generated. And now the simulation, the computer allows us to zoom out and look at the space-time metric one more time. And you see that there are ripples, just ripples on a, on a pond, just like that. It is those ripples, actually, that are these so-called gravitational waves. And those ripples contained information about the event that generated them. So then the idea is, well, if we somehow are able to read the passage of these ripples, we actually have information about the event that generated it. And that's the idea behind these detectors that I'm about to show. So the first question that you have to answer, well, what does a gravitational wave do, okay, once it passes through Earth, for example? So in this uh, little animation that you see in the background is Earth, and Earth now is exposed by, the, by the passage of a gravitational wave. And what, it, and what a gravitational wave does once it passes through Earth, it actually, it actually stretches things. It stretches and it squeezes them. Okay, and I'm not sure if the simulation actually did run. There you go. So it's, uh, you see the wave fronts the gravitational wave come and the Earth begins to wobble. Now, this is an animation and the wobbling is very, very small to the point that we have to go to great lengths to actually observe it. Okay, so it's not the wobbling you actually see it from, the, from this animation. There's no reason to be concerned. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we can just find a way to monitor uh, the passages of gravitational waves, to just monitor you know, stretches of space. And that's why in the end, the LIGO, the LIGO observatory, consists of these machines whose task is actually to monitor the stretching of space. And so we like to place these detectors far away from any city 
or far away from uh, densely populated regions to be completely isolated. And the first one I'd like to show you is uh, the one machine at Lago Hanford at, in Washington State, in the high desert of Washington State. This is a very big machine. It's an L-shaped object, four kilometers by four kilometers long. And it just its task is to monitor continuously the stretching of space between things. The thing is that we would like to have a network of these machines, more than one, simply because if there is a gravitational wave that passes, we just want to make sure that multiple machines see the passing. If you have multiple machines that see the passing, OK, then you have more confidence that what you saw was actually a gravitational wave. And that's why we have a sister one, the sister one in 3,000 miles away from the one in Washington State. This one is placed in Louisiana, in the marshlands of Louisiana. It essentially is a sister, a twin machine. It is uh, absolutely identical. The fact is it's just 3,000 miles away from the original one. What I have here, what I'm showing you here, is a, a plot of the waveform that these machines actually observed corresponding to the passage of gravitational wave. In red, you see the waveform due to the, one, uh, to the one placed in Washington State, the signal that was received in Washington State. In blue, the one in Louisiana. If it's a passage of gravitational wave, the two waveforms should be the same, so you can superimpose them next to each other, and sure enough, they are the same. That's great, fantastic. And then, right underneath it, and I'm not sure if the audience is able to discern this, but the graphs right underneath the red and blue graphs, there's a waveform which is in gray, gray in color. And that waveform is actually, um, it's a big deal. Uh, that waveform actually answers the question, well, if we believe in our understanding of the universe, which is general relativity. If we have two black holes and they orbit around each other, what should the gravitation wave look like? And that would be the gray curve. And if you look closely, the gray, the red, and the blue waveforms all lie on top of each other, which is absolutely shocking. They all match. Not only did the two machines actually saw the same thing, like they should, but also our understanding of the universe you know, seems to be very consistent to what was observed. So one thing that one thing that I could do is launch, feed this, these signals to speakers. And this is actually, you know, we, we do these things every once in a while. They're actually instructive. Because what you can do is you can uh, you can take these signals, feed them to speakers to play a sound. So this corresponds to a pitch. It's just that as time evolves, the pitch increases. And so it really is a sound. It's a well-known sound called the chirp. It goes something like whoop, something like this. So what I would like to do is I would like to play for you this particular sound. Um, and before we play it, um, mind you that when these uh, um, detectors were on, they actually observed two events, one in September, one in December. So they're gonna, you're going to be hearing two different sounds. And then the first batch of sound that you'll be hearing is the real thing. The second batch of sound that you will hear is actually the same waveform, but we adjusted the pitches so at the end you can better hear the pitch. Uh, you can better hear the, the chirp sound, if you will, please. You see, it is very interesting to actually have these waveforms uh, play on speakers so you can better appreciate what the event must have looked like. Uh, when, when I showed you the simulation of two black holes opening around each other, 
it was going quite slowly, so at the end we would appreciate that event. But these are massive objects, and they were moving quite fast in order to produce that sound. They, that sound reflects what the waveform was like. And so if you think about this, to make that sound, these objects were like, 20 solar masses on one side and another 20 solar masses on the other, we're going, we're flying. They were like 10%, 20%, 40% of the speed of light. Uh, quite impressive. That's the only way we can explain the sound that you just heard. Thank you. So we can hear the universe. <laughs> it's amazing. <clears throat> Just a curiosity. Um, when did you start to have the idea of studying the gravitational waves? I mean, wh what happened? Why, why did you? Yeah. Well, it, it was, it's a feat in technology. Um, that those machines that, uh, that you just saw, um, they're pushing technology to, to the limit. And so when we were starting this, we were fascinated, absolutely fascinated by, the, by the, the opportunity to just push technology so at the end you would um, actually make this kind of observations. I mean, Albert Einstein even predicted that these, that these gravitation waves exist. He was skeptical in the sense that, well, they're so small, how could we possibly measure them, okay? But 100 years after, after his studies, now we begin to, like, okay, we can find ways to get around technical problems. So I was completely fascinated by, by having this kind of possibility. Oh. <laughs> so um, now Polly. Polly Matzinger, Dr. Polly Matzinger, worked as a bartender Carpenter, jazz musician, playboy bunny, and drug trainer before going back to school to study the immune system, where she became intrigued by the number of poorly explained exceptions to the dominant model of immunity, the self-non-self -self model. She tried for years to reconcile them and finally abandoned the model, proposing an alternative, the danger model, which suggests that the immune system is far less concerned with things that are non-self than with those that do damage. The model has been the subject of a BBC Horizon film, as featured in three other films about immunity and in countless articles in both scientific and lay press. Polly created award-winning educational short films on the immune systems and is working on the next major question in the immune system, namely, once it decides to respond, how does the immune system know what kind of response to make? I have also to say that, if I can, <laughs> so I am particularly happy to introduce you, uh, Polly, because um, what happened is that I, I, I'm a scientist myself, and I'm studying cancer. And I was uh, curious. I wanted to. St I'm, I'm studying the evolution of the tumor, and I wanted to know how the microenvironment around the tumor really influenced this evolution of the tumor. And one of the major elements in the microenvironment of a tumor is the uh, immune system. And so I, but. I don't know a lot about the immune system, so a colleague suggested me to watch a series of videos, of lectures. Um, they were great in summarizing what could happen in the system. So I, one night I went and I watched the first of this video and it was Polly's video of explaining the beginning of the danger model. And I, um, well, I fell in love. <laughs> I was like, because of the way in which, uh, Polly, if I can say, you use reason. Uh, so you were intrigued by the fact that there are many, many things that you experience, or we all experience, that could not be explained 
by the current model of the immune system. And you didn't give up. You kept saying, if my experience sees this, and this model does not explain it, it has to be something else. And this interest and this is, you know, dynamic of using your reason, trying to understand the science in reality, really, really attracted me. And that's why I asked Polly to, to come here. So, Polly, can, can you tell us what is this danger model? Sure. And how did you get there? Sure. Yes. <laughs> so, Maria Theresa has asked me to not only explain the immune system, but also to explain a little bit about how um, scientists think. How do we get to where we get? So, we're going to move from 1.3 billion years ago. <laughs> to the 1970s, and we're going to move from very, very far away to inside us, and um, we're also going to move to very old-fashioned technology here. So is this working? Can I write on this? Yes. yes. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's start with the 1970s. Um, those of you who may have had a class in immunity, uh, either in medical school or college or whatever, were probably taught that the immune system functions by discriminating between self and non-self. That each individual immune system learns what self is early in life. So usually when you're still uh, a, a fetus, um, or maybe a few days after birth, Whatever is around at that time is called self, and whatever arrives later is called non-self. So later on, you get a virus. It's non-self. You fight it. You get a transplant. That's non-self. You fight it. That's what I was taught in the 1970s. And I had terrible trouble with that idea. And here is a couple of examples of the trouble I had. One was already an old problem for that model, and that is that um, fetuses should be non-self. A fetus is half the mother and half the father, and that should be called non-self, and they ought to be rejected, and they're not. Um, and my professors had some answers for that. And um, I asked them, okay, wait a minute, what about uh, puberty? I mean, we are not the same sitting in our chairs today, that we were a couple of days after birth. We change. And they patted me on the head and said, there, there, little girl, nothing new appears in puberty. It's just changes of hormones and other things like that that are already there, just changes in concentrations. And so I pointed out to them um, uh, a change um, that they hadn't thought about, mainly because they have Y chromosomes. <laughs> now, this is, this is a tissue that people with Y chromosomes do think about, but not in this way, right? This is the newly lactating breast, and it has cells that are making milk proteins that this body has never made before. And although most of those milk proteins go out into the outside world, a few of them, like alpha-lactalbumin, and beta-lactoglobulin actually go into the bloodstream. So this is non-self. This is something that arrived later in life. And um, they said, oh, that's because when this little girl was learning self, she was drinking mother's milk and becoming tolerant. And I said, you know what? My generation has actually done an experiment. When I was born in the late 1940s after World War II, it was not socially cool to drink mother's milk. You drank Carnation, Nestle's, Pet Milk. These companies are still trying to do this to third world women. But the important point was that when my generation grew up and started to lactate, our breasts didn't fall off. Somehow, the immune system knows how to deal with a changing self. So these are some of the problems I had, and lots more, but I don't have time today to go through them. But what happened was, there was no support for asking these questions and absolutely zero support for trying to answer them. And I did what we cowardly scientists often do. I stopped asking. 
And um, I spent four years in Cambridge, England, and six years in Switzerland trying to do experiments to see exactly how the immune system could discriminate self from non-self and still deal with these problems. We milked mice, for example. Um, and then I got a job at the NIH, National Institute of Health in, in DC, and there was a young doctor in the laboratory next door who was studying cancer, Ephraim Fuchs. And Ephraim, who is now at Hawkins, was asking the same questions, but for a different reason. He was asking, why is it that tumors, which we know have non-self parts, are not rejected? So tumors, some of them have viral components. Some of them have mutated proteins. Some of them have proteins that were on so early in embryogenesis that the immune system never had a chance to see them. They should be called foreign. Tumors should be rejected, and they're not. And I patted Ephraim on the head and said, there, there, <laughs> Not little guy, yeah? We all know that tumors are immunosuppressive. And unlike me, he didn't give up. And we spent the next few years arguing quite strongly um, and finally decided that, you know, an immune system that fights everything in the air you breathe and everything in the food you eat and everything else that's foreign, your fetuses and the sperm that bring you those fetuses, is an evolutionarily stupid immune system. Now, I know that many of you don't believe in evolution. I do. And do. Um, I use evolutionary reasonableness as a way to look at biology and ask if what somebody thinks about something is probably true or not. And one of the things I've discovered is that if it seems evolutionarily stupid, it's probably wrong. But what we decided was, after two years of arguing, um, was, is it possible that the immune system actually does something else? Is it possible that the immune system actually fights things that are dangerous rather than things that are foreign? It's a nice idea. Leave alone anything that isn't dangerous, food, sperm, etc., and only fight things that are dangerous like viruses. Um, but we needed a mechanism. We needed to know how the immune system can do that. And uh, that took another two years. It took one year to decide how does the immune system determine what is dangerous. For example, tumors are dangerous, but the immune system usually doesn't respond. Right? Transplants are not dangerous, and yet the immune system usually responds. So we needed a definition that works, meaning it explains what the immune system does right and also explains what it does wrong. Um, and that idea actually came to me in the bath. I have to tell you, I understand our committees. I was in the bath. I used to spend a lot of time in the bath, the game, writing. Um, and all of a sudden came this idea. It was really simple, and I don't understand why it took so long. It was, anything that does damage is dangerous, and anything that doesn't do damage is not dangerous. Pretty simple. OK. <laughs> Now what? How does the immune system know that something has entered the body and is doing damage? And that idea actually came while I was training a dog. Yeah? I got to tell you, your life impinges on your science. Um, I was training a sheep dog um, on sheep. And um, I have sheep. And um, in summer, sheep have these woolly coats. And you can't work too long because they get hot. So you take breaks. And we were taking a break. And we were on the top of a hill. And the sheep were at the bottom of the hill. And there were some trees behind and a little stream. And um, my dog was curled up at my feet. And all of a sudden, this sheep came running out of the woods, going, ma, ma. By the way, they don't do bat. They do ma. <laughs> um, and the dog woke up and went running into the woods to see what was scaring the sheep. And what I understood from that is that there is actually a cell in the body that acts like this sleeping sheepdog. It's called a dendritic cell uh, because it has dendrites like nerves. And um, they're in all the organs that we have studied. So in the skin, for example, each dendritic cell is in contact via these long projections 
with 50 to 500 skin cells. It's just sitting there asleep, touching the skin. And if something damages the skin, it wakes up. So what I learned was it wasn't the immune system that had seen that something was doing damage. It was the damaged cell that was telling the immune system that it was damaged. So how does that work in modern immunological theory? What I'd like to do now is to take you through about 80 years of immunology theory and show you how other people have made theories, which ones we stand on, and how we differ. All right? It's a little bit of immunology 101. <laughs> so in 1953, um, a man named McFarlane Burnett, who got the Nobel Prize for this, was the first person to suggest that the immune system functions by discriminating between self and non-self. Now, he was in Australia right after the war, and um, Australia was a kind of xenophobic country at that time. There were a lot of people from Indonesia and places like that, Japan, that were trying to get to Australia. There was the them and the us, and the model that he came up with was very much an us versus them. Right? What he said was the cells, these are called B cells, that are half of the uh, functional part of the immune system, the effector part of the immune system, work by discriminating self from non-self. So each B cell has on its surface about 100,000 copies of an antibody that it's going to make. Now, antibodies get secreted by these B cells into the blood. If you get a virus, the B cells will respond they will start making antibody. Within about five days, seven days, your blood is now filled with these antibodies against the virus, and that ends your infection. Each antibody can bind to one kind of thing. So there are antibodies that can bind poliovirus, other antibodies that can bind uh, hepatitis virus, other antibodies that can bind bacteria or pollen for people who are allergic. Each one specific for one thing out there on the planet. And by the way, some that can see things that have never existed. They're made randomly. The immune system is ready for anything, including chemicals that people in pharmaceutical companies and oil companies and whatever are putting into our environment today. Each one is specific. The idea was you remove early in life the ones that can see self. So the only ones that are left are the ones that can see non-self. This was 1953. That model lasted until 1969, so a long time. Um, and in 69, it was modified by Brecher and Cohn at the Salk Institute in San Diego. And what they did is they added another cell and another signal. Um, and the reason they did this is that it was discovered that when B cells respond to a virus or a bacterium, not only do they multiply to make a small army, not only do they start making 2,000 antibody molecules per second each, right? they also mutate, they change. And the reason for that is that if a B cell binds very weakly to, say, flu virus, when it makes daughter cells that start to change, some of those cells will bind more strongly to flu. So your immune response gets better as you get flu more and more times. Does that make sense? Yeah. But the pro problem with that is if you've lost early in life the B cells that can see self, and now you get flu, and some of these B cells start to change, some of them can now begin to see self. And that's a problem. And they solved it by adding a second cell. In the same way that these uh, astronomers use two machines to make sure that what they're looking at is real, yeah? Brecher and Cohn suggested that to get an immune response, you need two cells to detect the foreign invader. <laughs> they suggested that there was a cell called a helper, and that the helper interacted with the B cell, such that we now know it's true, by the way, the B cell, when it binds to flu, brings it inside, breaks it into little pieces, 
puts the little pieces on its surface in special Schlepper molecules. Yeah? And the helper cell sees that. And if both the helper and the B cell see it, the helper now gives a signal to the B cell called help. So the first signal to the B cell is the recognition of flu. We boringly call that signal one. <laughs> and the second signal is help from the T cell, the helper cell, and we boringly call that signal two. Okay. So you don't get an immune response until both of these cells see the same foreign invader. That was their suggestion in 1969. By the way, they suggested if you really want to fix it, require three. And I bet if these guys had their choice and enough money, they would also put up three. <laughs> right? The problem with that is that the frequency of any B cell against a particular foreign invader is about one in a million. And of a T helper cell is also about one in a million. So if you needed three cells, you would need 10 to the 18 cells. And we don't even have that many cells in our body. So they settled on two. This is how immune theory happens. Okay, that lasted from 69 until 73. And in 73, Lafferty and Cunningham, back in Australia, added another cell and another signal. And the cell they brought in to the conversation, they called an accessory cell. We today call that an antigen presenting cell. Antigen, very funny word in immunology, it means antibody generator anything that can cause the immune system to make antibodies, okay? And we have these special cells that present them. And the reason they brought that cell in is that by this time in the late 60s, it was discovered that T helper cells also seem to have a kind of species specificity. That if you take the helper cells from one human and you offer them as a target, cells from another human, they make an extremely strong response. This is the response that prevents you from getting a transplant from somebody else. Okay. But if you take the T cells from a human and you offer them target cells from a mouse or a dog or a sheep, the response is not so strong. And yet you would expect that a mouse, a dog, and a sheep are more foreign to a human than another human is. And so they suggested that this helper cell also needed a second signal, and that that signal was species specific. So they said that when the helper cell sees its antigen, that which it can recognize, it gets signal one, alone that tells it to die, unless it gets a second signal from the presenting cell. Okay. This one they called also signal two, but they called it co-stimulation. Now, something interesting then happened. This was 73. In 1986, co-stimulation was discovered experimentally by accident. Okay? We don't have to wait usually 100 years. <laughs> um, but until it was rediscovered by accident, it was totally ignored. Immunologists simply ignored that theory. They weren't interested in doing experiments on these cells. They knew they existed. But they didn't think they were important. And then it was rediscovered by accident that these cells had to be alive and had to give a second signal to a helper cell before you got an immune response. Why was it ignored for so long? The reason is it doesn't fit the model. Right? The cells that do this pick up anything in their environment. They are constantly drinking their environment. They're in the tissues, they're in the skin, they're in the heart, they're in the kidneys, they're everywhere. And they are con they're picking up dead cells, they're picking up debris, they're picking up the stuff that a cell exudes after it stops using its food, the waste products, constantly. They do not discriminate between self and non-self. So if this is the cell that is required to start an immune response, and it can't discriminate self from non-self, how can the immune system do that? And because it didn't fit the model, it was totally ignored. And in 1986, it was rediscovered by accident, and then people couldn't ignore it anymore. And in fact, people started to really study it. In 1989, a guy named Charlie Janeway at Yale came up with a solution to this problem, that here's a cell that's there, it's true, the data say it exists, and it doesn't fit the model. 
He said they also have a self, non-self discrimination. That they, over evolutionary time, have learned to see evolutionarily distant non-self. So he suggested that these receptors, that these cells have receptors um, for bacteria, which are very, very distant from us. And so this, and that they're normally asleep, and that they only wake up if they bind a bacterium, and that only when they wake up can they give the second signal. And so what you see here is that they were putting this second signal back under the discrimination of a self, non-self signal. And when Charlie first suggested that, I said, you know, that's fine. It explains how you can respond to bacteria, but it doesn't explain how you respond to a transplant. Most well-done transplants are not covered in bacteria. Yeah? It doesn't explain how you can sometimes reject a tumor. It doesn't explain how you get autoimmune disease. And Charlie said, ah, none of that's a problem. Yeah? Because um, transplantation is a modern invention. We didn't evolve to deal with that. And by the way, that's another Y chromosome idea. Because <laughs> remember that half the population gets injected with cells called sperm by the other half of the population. And that's called a transplant. And we have to deal with it. And tumors, Charlie said, and autoimmunity kill you late enough in life that you've already had your kids and so evolution doesn't care. And Ephraim and I said, you know what? If you want to describe what the immune system does, you have to describe what it does, not just what you happen to think it evolved to do. And it does reject transplants. And it does give us autoimmune disease. So we solved this problem by following tradition. We added another cell and another signal. <laughs> And the cell we brought into this conversation is the end of the line. There are no more cells you can add. <laughs> because what we've done is we've brought into this conversation every cell in the body. And what we've actually said is that the receptors on the surface of these sleeping presenting cells are not there to look at bacteria. They're there to look at alarm signals sent by destroyed uh, cells or cells that don't die in a normal way, or cells that are toxified by things in our environment or by toxins from infections. Cells that are physiologically unhappy send signals that wake up the presenting cell. It's a very simple assumption. You don't get an immune response until you wake up an antigen presenting cell and you wake it up by alarm signals from damaged or stressed tissues. So only if a cell is in trouble does the immune system respond. Right? Now, we follow tradition. We add another cell, another signal. We've taken one more step down the same path. But it turns out that if you take that step with me, you fall off a cliff, and you look at the immune system from a different point of view. And it turns out that if you look at the immune system from that point of view, you can explain almost everything it seems to get right and almost everything it seems to get wrong. Very quick list. I don't have time to explain them all to you, but here's the list. You can explain why you don't kill yourself at puberty. At least it's an auto accident, not an immune response, right? You can explain why fetuses are not rejected. The cell death that goes on in fetal life is normal programmed cell death. The fetus does not send alarm signals. But should the fetus get infected, you will respond. And if in the process of clearing that infection, you clear the fetus, which sometimes happens, at least you're alive to have another one. Yeah? You can explain why sperm are not rejected. Yeah? They're not dangerous, usually. <laughs> you can explain why transplants, depends on what culture you're in. You can explain why transplants are, not reject are rejected why tumors are usually not rejected. Transplants, where's the damage in a transplant? Surgeons. They cut, they burn small vessels, they put organs on helicopters and fly them around the country, they get death of that organ as it's been pulled out of the body. That is not programmed cell death, that is alarm signals all over the place. 
If you can block those alarm signals, you should get transplants to take, and we have some experiments showing that. Um, why you get graft versus host disease, for those of you that are uh, medically trained. And why there are parasites, like filaria, which gives you elephantiasis, which lives in intimate contact with the cells of the immune system, and yet you don't respond, because it's not doing the kind of damage the immune system responds to. There are more things you can explain. When I teach this to elementary school kids, I give them the following two scenarios, and then I'll be done. I tell them this. If you think of the body as a community, the old self-non-self -self model said that the immune system are the police, and they are constantly going around the body, the community, looking for foreigners. And when they find them, they shoot them. And they define a foreigner as anybody they had not already met by the time they finished high school. <laughs> so this is a community that has no tourists, no traveling salesmen, no immigrants, because every foreigner, foreigner is shot. <clears throat> the danger model says no. Um, if you think of the body as a community, the immune system is more like firemen. They sit in their fire stations playing cards until somebody rings an alarm. And it doesn't matter if the alarm is rung by a member of the community or a passing through tourist. And it doesn't matter if the fire was set by a member of the community or a traveling salesman. Yeah? The firemen don't respond until they hear an alarm. And unlike the cops, they can do more than one thing. They take a different truck if it's a cat up a tree than if it's a three alarm fire. So I think it's time actually that we stop thinking of the immune system as a xenophobic community. Our bodies are not sterile. We have more bacteria living in us than us. Okay? We need them to help digest the food we eat. Our individual smells, if we don't use too much deodorant, are caused by the bacteria that live there. Our skin is kept healthy by the bacteria that live there. We don't want to get rid of them. We want to nurture them and make sure the right ones are there. And this model of the immune system allows that to happen. Thanks so much for listening. Polly, um, it's amazing. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to express one thing that that was the reason actually how I mean it's so attractive the way in which you can understand you know how how the system works and to the point that there is a there is a beauty in it. No, it is really beautiful and in fact. We call this um, event the art of science that came from, actually I saw this in one interview to you at the, in the New York Times when you were saying that science is actually an art. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Okay. Yeah, why? Why is it, why is it an art? Um, so my sister is an artist. Uh, she's a sculptor. She used to be a painter. And um, yeah, although she thinks very differently, from the way I think. We agree that we're both trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to paint a picture of nature. And the reality of that and what we paint are not necessarily the same, but we're both trying to get at the reality in one way or another. So in her sculptures, she's trying to get at the reality of social interactions, which you can imagine might be difficult to do in brass. But that's what she does, right? And she does experiments just like we do. I remember her doing canvas after canvas after canvas of trying to find out how to paint the warmth of the sun. Wow. How do you paint the strength of the wind? And we're doing the same thing. And I don't think our paintings are necessarily any more right than hers. Right? There is a reality out there. 
And we try as best we can to understand it and make mathematical equations, which are probably closer than anything I'm doing. Um, but we understand that 100 years from now, the picture we paint of the reality may not be the same as what somebody then paints having more knowledge. And, and just I was I wanted to ask you, uh, Luca. Um, so, precisely this point of the reality, the entire theme of the New York encounter, the reality, the, the no betray me does not betray us, no. And I think this is not so much because what we plan to see happens, right? But because. It, exist and precisely because it exists is as an appeal to us, you know, like a sort of a promise to enter into something. How much this attraction play in your research, you know, this this appealing of the object, these gravitational waves, how much is important this appeal and how much is that is just a routine calculation of these, you know, blips or other signs that you have to... How much the appeal, you mean? Yeah. Uh, um, let's see. From this particular... Exp well, I, I live in a very particular moment right now because of the great success that my project has had. Um, so I'm in a state of wonder, even though everything it's so it's, it's very, very strange for me. Everything worked out the way it's supposed to, <laughs> and it hardly ever. Uh, you know, so it did happen this way, and I'm kind of in a wonder state, uh, if you will. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about the things that we do as a, as a scientist is that um, in the end, we do have time to be creative and to think about things to have come up with our own ideas. But at the end of the day, though, by training, at the end of the day, all my dreams, they have to come down to, well, is my interpretation, my understanding of what is out there consistent with what I see? Hmm. So, so in the end of the day, for, my, for the things that I do, I, we use telescopes, other people might use experiments of that sort, but it's always a game. So you can dream all you want, and this is fantastic. It's just that at the end of the day, you have to take that dream, that idea that you had, and compare it to, in the end, what you observed. And it's a game that you play. And sometimes you attach yourself to these ideas very, very strongly. Okay? And it is that moment when you actually go for the experiment, to go to the telescope, and you actually have to compare it, that, uh, that you're facing reality. Right? Yeah. Um, and actually, I think that there was a major upheaval in your church about this once, some time ago. <laughs> um, there was a time when it was thought that the Earth was the center of everything. Hmm. Hmm? Because humans live on Earth, and humans are the center of everything. And even when the reality, when the observations didn't fit, right? Um, there are people who refuse to look at those observations and understand that they're important. Um, and I think finally Copernicus was uh, said to be okay in the Catholic Church. I actually saw something in the last few days that reminded me of that in a different way. Um, and that is that one of the things I've seen here is a little similar to the Earth being the center of everything, and that is that humans are the center of everything. And um, I'm an atheist, and so it's, I don't have the same point of view, um, but I would like to at least suggest that there may come a time when just as uh, acknowledging that Copernicus was correct, it may came ta come time to acknowledge that we need to start thinking about this planet that was given to us, as Pope Francis said in his encyclical, this planet was given to us and we need to take care of it. And being only human focused isn't necessarily the best way to do that. We are related, whether you think it's evolution or creation, we are related to everything that's living on this planet. 
the genetic code that we use is more similar to the genetic code used by grass than the genetic codes of two different kinds of bacteria. We are more related to grass than some bacteria are related to each other. We are related. And I think it's really important to remember that and to start acknowledging the data that are out there, that everything out there isn't only about humans. Well, the humans have this capacity, I would say, to really be aware of that. And it's this, this wonder, this sense of the mystery, precisely because we, the, 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 entire, the entire universe, you know, becomes part of us because we, we are aware of it. We can see it, we can experience it, we can, you know, enjoy it, we can be full of wonder. And this is exactly what, in a way, um, the position of, of, of the human reason, this capacity to be open, open like a window in front of reality and not so much like scheme, right? So I totally and, agree with that. And to check everything we think. Yes. Against the reality As, of what is out there, yeah? Yes, and it's precisely this attention to reality, to, to what exists as the points to something beyond, right? Points to something bigger. But I, I, have, I have a curiosity here, and I, I kept thinking about it from the beginning. So for years and years, you kept thinking about this doesn't fit, this doesn't fit, precisely the same thing you were saying. I have to see my idea. And, and you, for years and years, uh, you know, to hear this blip. <laughs> so if this blip did not come, okay, if, it, if this years and years and years of and putting these huge instruments and then you didn't hear this blip, you know, what the, this a wasted time, you know, what is, what is the success for you, you know, is to find out what you thought? Can you tell, and also you, I want to hear. <laughs> well, I can tell you that when we heard that blip, Dismissed, completely. Was like missed? Dis dismissed. Well, Was dismissed. Well, uh, we hear all sorts of blips all the time. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it's like, please, another blip, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that uh, it wouldn't go, this blip wouldn't go away. In other words, we have a, a protocol to follow in order to eliminate the various blips. And so we follow the protocol, blah, 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 and it wouldn't go away, right? And so, as time goes by and it doesn't go away, then you start to sweat. <laughs> yes. and sweat droplets go down, you know, check this, check that, and it doesn't go away. Oh my God, it's not going away. Come on, let's make it go away. Plus, we have also fire drills in the sense that we give them little thing, um, little tests. So, so well, this is a conjunction to the previous question. So, in conjunction to the previous question, for for me, well, at times reality is hard. Um, also for the little blip, the little blip that, that you guys saw, it was a significant event and we, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it that this, a system like this would actually exist. What is success for me? Well, I tell you, the, the, for me, the source of success, the, 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 the pleasure that I get out of doing things of that sort is not really the detection itself. Of course, uh, there's big success now, and but it, for me, it's uh, taking that. It happens most of the time when I'm actually not at work and I'm thinking about things at work. When I am in these moments, when I'm resting, when I'm taking a shower, when I'm taking, a, I like to drive. When I go for long drives. And I'm able to think about the things that I'm dealing with and to look at them in a different, with different eyes. You know, you're completely relaxed. And it is in those moments that I'm able to be way more creative, to look at things in different ways. I don't, I don't do that much math, okay? Um, but 
I treasure very much, there are just a handful of moments in my life where at the end something like this did happen. And I consider that to, to be the source of joy for the things that we do, for me. But that's my personal. Um, and so I, regardless, yeah. regardless of finding the blip, there is something even in the way, in the journey, to look for it. Well, the blip, it turns out, well, at the end, the blip, of course, confirms all the things that we were doing. It's a big deal. But, you know, if you were to ask me personally yeah. what gets me going, it, 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 the moments that I treasure the most, um, I think those moments where I'm creative the most, I, I'm facing problems. I have different... I have this problem, this problem, this problem at work, I need to be able to solve it. That's my, that's my job. You know, I'm trained to do something like this. Um, but to, I, I receive so much joy in finding those moments, and they don't come because I want them to, be, to just appear. I find so much joy in actually looking at the problem, different angles, right? and um, use my creativity in different ways to come up with these solutions. I, I, for me, it's, it's wow. a great amount of joy. So the problem, the problem is, uh, is a positive thing because it allows you to yeah. be more creative in the way in which you respond. Would you say the same? Uh, exactly. You sit in the bath. You've been worried about it for two years. Now, I actually think <laughs> that the best state for a scientist's mind is confusion. And confusion? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm serious about this. I also think we're developmentally retarded, but that's another question. Um, <laughs> oh, so let's be serious about that. We are developmentally retarded. So in normal human development, children are very curious. They ask lots of questions. They drive their parents crazy, right? And then they go through this stage and they stop asking all those questions, or at least they ask many fewer questions. It's kind of like there's a stage where you can learn language very easily and other stages where you no longer do that so easily. We have these developmental stages. Scientists never grow out of that. We are constantly asking questions. We drive our, our colleagues nuts. <laughs> and along with that retardation of that developmental change comes others. You know, the, the absent-minded professor is not an accident. It's really true. <laughs> but anyway. I, I think the best state for a scientist is confusion, because once you're no longer confused, you think you have the answer. Okay. However, I got to tell you, when you leave that state of confusion, when you're in the bath and you have an idea, when you're driving long distance and all of a sudden, or that early morning period when your brain is working on its own and you're not quite awake yet, and suddenly you have an idea, so you jump out of the bath naked and run around the house. I understand Archimedes. <laughs> <laughs> That, it's like being an addict and having a shot. It is an amazing adrenaline rush. And your whole body feels it. And I feel so lucky to have found that art. Because unlike my sister, I can't paint or sculpt. But I've found mine, you have found yours. We have been lucky enough to find a form of art that speaks to us, that gives us that adrenaline rush. And that's why we're in it. You know, people say we're doing this to help mankind. I think we're really just addicts. <laughs> I just want to, to close to thank um, both Luca and Polly for this really engaging uh, event. And um, last night, it was very late, we were uh, discussing among friends about what was happening here, and we were thinking about um, this, this event on science and, and precisely these, these moments in which something finally appears, and you say, it's true, it's true, it's finally true. And we found a um, tiny, tiny piece that I wanted to read you, the translation is not great, we did it during the night, but, um, that I think is from Giussani, the, 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 the person that you know, started. Uh, started the communal liberation. He was saying, what is encountering the truth? It is more than something that becomes evident. 
It has a connotation of sharing the same being. If something had appeared to you from which your body was born and from which you detached yourself and which you had been seeking, seeking, wandering around, and this something comes to meet you. Yeah, cool. <laughs> it is the evidence of the truth which affects you and which causes you to become one with it. The act of knowledge is not such until it ends in attachment. Thank you.